Luke chapter 5 today, but in the Luke chapter 4 at the end, it says these words, the last two verses, they were trying to get him to stick around in their region because he had done great healings, miracles, and teaching, and the people tried to get him to stay with them, which is kind of unique to see because there were other places where they begged him to leave, <laughs> prayed that he would leave. Well, not here in uh, Galilee at this point, in verse uh, 43 of Luke, he, he answers them and he says unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Now this is powerful because two words are used for preaching. One is, and the, the first one is, the word euangelion, which means to evangelize or gospelize the people. Tell them good message. He's going to tell them the good message of the kingdom of God. The second word where it says he preached in the synagogues is the word keruso, and that word means he heralded it. It's like a herald going from place to place through a city and letting something be known. Like when news was to be spread through a society, that was typically how it was done. Probably how Jonah got the word to Nineveh, the whole city. He just went from each uh, heralding post and he brought the words of destruction to Nineveh. Well, what we have is our Lord Jesus working very, very diligently and getting the gospel of the kingdom. Interestingly enough, there are uniquenesses when we talk about gospel. Uh, there is the gospel of our salvation, which we understand to be that Christ was uh, crucified or died for our sins, according to the scripture, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And uh, we see the gospel there as the gospel of salvation. But this is the gospel of the kingdom. Very important to distinguish because the context in which Jesus is preaching is a people is to a people who uh, are not yet ready for the gospel of salvation as it will come into its own after his death, burial, and resurrection. So you see the difference. He hasn't died and was buried and rose again yet. What is he preaching? Well, you're going to see a little bit of what he's preaching in the chapter 5 because he's going to talk to them about deep truths that they have missed almost forever, okay? They were a people pulled out to lay a foundation, if you will, for the greater purpose that God had in winning the entire world. But they never really got their eyes on the rest of the world. They always built walls and fences rather than bridges to the world. They always wanted everybody, you know, they just always wanted everybody to be at arm's length. Either that or they went out of their midst of their own people and they went to the rest of the world and said, we want to be like everybody else. They just never got on board with what God was trying to accomplish. Important to note, because when we come to chapter 5, what we're going to see is his preaching and how he did it. And when I talk about that, I want you to remember that the title of the message this morning is Reaching to the Heart. If you want to understand how the Lord Himself did things, you can kind of see it in a microcosm right here in chapter 5. You're going to see Him talking and reaching to dock workers, first of all. Now, I like that. <laughs> people who work with their hands for a living, you know? Folks who are real, salt of the earth kind of people. You're going to see Him reaching to the disillusioned. And that we will see as well. We'll see him reaching to doctors and we'll see him reaching to the disgruntled. So in this chapter, you're going to see him changing up his methodology as we go through. So keep that in mind. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret uh, and he saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships which was Simon's, and he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. Now this is an interesting picture. I mean, it's pretty easy to get your mind around. It's something we would all be uh, feeling uh, in our kind of viscerally because we would think of the salt air or something. We would think of the breeze off of the water. I mean, if you go up to Lake Erie very often, you might have certain nostalgic connections with the water. Well, when you see it called the Lake of Gennesaret, no, this is also known as the Sea of Galilee. This is the Sea of Galilee. He's up in the northwestern quarter of that area, and he's really just getting the gospel out. He's been doing things already. He was doing it in chapter 4, but now 
He's moved from one place to another, and he's come up to this little area by the uh, edge of the shore. He sees two ships, and as you see that, you see that he is taking in his uh, surroundings, and he's looking at everything. But when he sees the two ships, don't think this is a, 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 what we might call a haphazard or sort of random. Because what's really going on here is the Lord is not just preaching to the people. He's also reaching to disciples. Uh, he's already met Peter, James, and John. He's already met them, but here is where they're going to be called. So I'm giving you a little you know, back of the book look here. Because he's, he's not really recruited them as apostles yet. You may recall that when John was preaching by uh, the Jordan River, uh, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And then the next day after he had been baptized and everything, he's, he's watching Jesus. And under his breath almost, it seems, he says, Behold the Lamb of God in a more personal, like awe kind of way. And a couple of his closer disciples uh, heard him and they went and followed him. Because they said, Man, if he's John's hero, then he's going to be my hero too. And so we saw that, and we saw when John was preaching and Jesus came into his own, Andrew went and got his brother, Peter. So he's already seen Jesus. Is not this the Messiah? There's a couple of things you need to get your mind around contextually. So Jesus isn't just haphazardly seeing two ships. He's actually got a couple of guys that he's got his eye on. And I just want to say that God's got his eye on you. <laughs> okay, he does. He's got his eye on every God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Isn't that right? And so no matter who you are, where you are, or what you're up to, God knows where you are and he knows what you're up to. And he loves you anyway. He understands how you are and why you are the way you are. I think that's important to know. Nobody knows you more intimately than Jesus and he loves you anyway. But then it comes down to this. There comes a time of crisis and choice. And that's why the title of the message, again, is the idea of reaching the heart. How do you reach the heart? This chapter, I said, doctors, which includes the Pharisees and people who are very intelligent. He reached to, to those people, even though they were the ones who would set themselves at odds against him on a very deliberate uh, fashion and in a very deliberate way. And so when we see this, he, it says that the, it came to pass that the people pressed upon him in verse 1 to hear the word of God. What a, what a good day that must have been. It says to hear the word of God. I, I find it interesting he doesn't say to be healed. He's going to say that again and later he's going to say to hear the word of God and to be healed. Uh, hear and healed. You know, those are going to get connected and eventually healed's going to overcome the hear. Okay? They're, they're going to say, where's the bread and where's the food? You fed 5,000. They're going to start getting into all the gifts and forget about the giver. It's easy to do, isn't it? Easy to do. So we're looking at dock workers here. Notice, it's talking about a crowd. It's talking about people pressing him. It's talking about him teaching them, but it doesn't tell us anything that he's taught. Why? Because he's reaching to the dock workers. He's looking for some disciples. He's looking for some people who will be up close and personal followers of his own. The Bible says there were two ships sailing, uh, were sitting there, and the, the, the fellows are there washing their nets. They've already had contact with Jesus. We're going to find in the context of the passage uh, that they've been toiling all night and taking nothing, right? You remember the story. If you've read your Bible a little bit, you probably remember what's going to happen here to some degree. But know this. These guys are not even really listening to Him right now. He's preaching and they're washing their nets. And, you know, it's kind of keeping their head down. I don't know, but then you get in the presence of somebody as good as Jesus, you might want to keep your head down. <laughs> Maybe that's their thing. We'll do what we know. We'll do what we can. You know, and they're thinking, and maybe if you look at the passage, it's almost like it, it came upon him. They began to press upon him is the feel you get, because then he needs a place to stand, because people began to gather. So maybe they were just doing their work. He was just hanging out with them a little bit nearby. They got one ear to him, but it's not really a scheduled meeting or whatever. And suddenly he says, uh, he got up in the ship and the Bible says uh, that he said to the one, in verse 3, it says he entered into the one of the ships, and it says, and, uh, which was Simon's, and it says, and he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. So again, he's touching, G he's touching Simon again. He's touching Simon again. Interesting, isn't it? How many times will Jesus have to touch us before he gets our attention? When I was first being, uh, being, kind of growing up into this thing called life, there were little times as a child God touched me, or little times as a teenager God touched me. 
They were little episodes, but they were, they were remembered. I could tell you about them because they're personal. He touched my life. He was there for me. And he began to move in different ways. And I trust, because the Bible says that the Spirit does this, uh, that he's touching your life too. The Bible says the Spirit uh, goes into all the world to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Think about that. Sin, because that's what we got going on. Righteousness, because that's what he's got going on. And judgments, because that's what we need to be careful of. That's one of the touches. Just that knowledge about the judgment of God. Somewhere somebody told you about hell. Somebody told you about heaven. And I want you to know that God is in heaven where is fullness of joy. Where are pleasures forevermore. It's at the end of Psalm 16. You can read it. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is fullness of joy. I want you to know that there's a payoff for following Jesus. It's not all take up your cross and follow me. It's there's a destination in store for you. It's glory. It's bliss. It's the everlasting joy upon your brow. This is not worth selling out for down here. And that's one of the things that we all have to get our minds around.